Yeah. Okay, so it's a delight to be here. I and mean, as John said, I spent a lot of my career in York. I was reflecting a trend here and did my MSc in Health Economics here in 1984. Um, so I worked at the university a long time, was deputy director of the Centre for Health Economics at the university, and then moved to Leeds to the university there for five years, and then, as John said, came back, set up the Oxford Number Public Health Observatory here in 2004, uh, and then, as John said, that transitioned into uh, Public Health England in 2013. So I spent a combination of my career in <coughs> academic life, in the NHS, and, and now in the civil service, so I'm still Still getting used to being a civil servant a bit, which is why I'm very nervous about this camera. <laughs> <laughs> so very careful when I say you will notice that the logo the there in the top left, Jenny, will you know she worked in the civil service. Can you turn it off and then you'll get more? We might do that at the end. But uh, there, are, there are large manuals about the positioning of that logo and what the logo has, a big issue in all the rest of it. So you have to be very careful. <laughs> So, um, so it's, it's a delight to be here. Um, what I'm going to do, the, the older I get, the less interest I get in going through lots of PowerPoint slides. So I'll, I'll very happily leave my PowerPoint slides for John, but I'm going to pick and choose a little bit about what I covered tonight. Um, and hopefully it's of interest. But the theme of my talk is really going to be around this question of investing in prevention and what I see as common ground for, the, for both the public health system and the NHS. Um, as I go along, I gather quotes about economists. I, I'll, I'll spare the jokes about economists, but I did hear a very, one very interesting one the other week. Uh, some wise words from a professor of health economics from Holland, who, uh, who said that the first lesson of economics is scarcity, and the first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. <laughs> that was a really interesting and a very really wise statement because. I've spent all my career, I suppose, arguing, and it's one of the things you've taught as an economist, that economics is an aid to decision making. So it's not the decision itself. You know, we live in a very, very political world. You, you've all worked, us work in the NHS, you know how political the NHS system is. Uh, and obviously the, the world I inhabit on a day-to-day -day basis is, is a very political world at national level. For, fortunately, I managed to spend most of my, or at least half of my working week in New York. I spend two days a week in London. But in those two days, you obviously, uh, the job is about convincing people at a national level about how we should do this stuff. So some of the things that John talked about, mm. is the Childhood Obesity Plan, uh, Alcohol Strategy, Alcohol Evidence Review we're currently working on, a lot of that is about trying to influence the politicians. And that's a job both nationally and locally. Uh, the NHS, um, uh, sorry, Public Health has moved into local government, as you will gather from the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. So where we're currently based, actually, our PHE York office is in West offices near the station. So we're in with the council and the NHS, which is great. Uh, but that that context of having, <coughs> excuse me, local local politicians and national politicians is what the job is all about. And we have to find ways of influencing. And economic evidence is only one part of that. So I'm not standing here as an economist who thinks that everybody should be more rational and if only we had all more and more economic evidence the world would be a better place. I think I think we can use the economic evidence we've got, but ultimately it's to influence politicians. So, um, I shall skip over that. Um, <coughs> in, in true lecturing style, these are the take-home messages, so once you've read those, you can probably have a nap. <laughs> so these, these are the things that really matter. That first point is the most important one for me. Is I, in, in my 30 years or so career, um, I don't remember a better opportunity for us to get this shifting the balance of resources towards prevention and early intervention. And the thing I wrote down just this afternoon when I was finally going to go through my slides again was I'm standing here talking about investing in prevention and, and in some ways it's a blindingly obvious thing to say and do. You know, no, nobody would sort of argue if you're saying that sort of prevention is better than cure a bit. Why, why would anybody argue? In which case, why is it so difficult? Because when I talk to directors of public health around the country, they have this day-to-day -day challenge with their local politicians trying to, to persuade people that they should put money into investing in prevention. Um, what I will argue is that to radically change the system we've got at the moment, 
we absolutely have to do things differently uh, and change, radically change that balance of resource towards prevention and early intervention. The other bullet points are probably less important, I'll touch on some of them as we go along, but ultimately the second last bullet point there about system incentives is the other one that I bang on about on a day-to-day -day basis nationally. In the NHS we don't have the incentives right to get us to move towards prevention and early intervention, and I'll give, give an example of that. <coughs> the last bullet point, the, the thing that keeps me awake at night is the constant requirement, the constant push to get money out of the system so everybody sees investing in prevention as an opportunity to get cash out of the system and it ain't that simple as those of you who've worked in the NHS will know trying to get hospitals to stop doing the things that they've traditionally done trying to get money out of the, the healthcare system is an enormously difficult thing to do so we have to look at things differently I'm going to start with the financial climate and there is a reason why economics is called the dismal science so we'll get the dismal bit out of the way um, this was quite an interesting um, graph that John Appleby, who's Chief, uh, uh, Chief Economist at the King's Fund, produced before the election in uh, May last year. So you can ignore the, the yellow and red uh, lines, the blue dots, the one that matters. So the pe people will remember probably before the election, people were talking about a 30 billion gap in, in NHS finances. That was the figure that was being quoted. Um, and that largely was being uh, broken down into the Two figures on the right hand side there, the 22 billion, 22 billion pound productivity gap um, that is in the system and the 8 billion extra that the Conservatives pledge and indeed has, has now played out through the system. So there's an extra 8, I think it's 8.4 billion to be exact, that's going to be in the system between now and 2020, 2021. And that is that that 8.4 billion is it's staged between now and then, so it's front loaded. So about half of it comes in the uh, the early years of the of the electoral cycle. But that 30 billion gap is is why people talk about the funding crisis in the NHS. And when I give these talks, I, I say if it's to an NHS audience, I tend to say if you think you've got it bad in the NHS, then that is the local government future funding outlook model, uh, which is pretty dire. And those of you who know anything about local government finances will know that whole services have been cut at the moment. Uh, so people are not just thinking around the margins, they're actually thinking about how do they disinvest in whole services. And it's because there's a very similar sort of funding gap. By about 2019-20, there's about a 14 billion gap there. And uh, if you take that together with the NHS gap, it's a really quite substantial hole. And the comprehensive spending review that came out in uh, uh, was it about a year? Was it about a year ago? I can't remember. Later than that. Anyway, fairly recently, the, the comprehensive spending review highlighted the, the extra money for the NHS, but made the point that really uh, it would still require a very significant transformation of the healthcare system over the next five years. Local authorities, as it says, they will experience even greater cuts. Um, so the public health grant, which is the amount of money that goes straight to local authorities, takes about another roughly 10% cut by 2019-20. And when you look at that in real terms, that's a very substantial cut. Um, what we call the public health grant ring fence will also be lifted from 2018-19 and we'll move to a system called business rates retention, which I won't bore you with now, but there's a lot of concern in the public health field about making sure that when the ring fence grant comes off we've still got money protected in local government for public health. So the financial picture is not great, um, which means that we, we have to think more and more about how we use the existing cake. There was a WHO report um, a couple of years ago that talked about the amount of money that national uh, uh, that nations spend in Europe on, on prevention and it's a bit like comparing apples and pears, but the, the typical figure that's quoted is around 3% of national health budgets get spent on prevention with, with quite a wide range. So one of the things that we're doing, and this is really all leading up to the next spending review, which will be in about four years' time, um, is to think how, how much do we currently spend on prevention across the, what I would call the three systems of public health, NHS and social care. And the short answer is we don't know, but people people tend to bandy about a figure of about 4% to 
terms of what we currently spend. And that's largely based on the amount that goes to the public health ring fence grant and other bits, such as screening and immunisation. But in relation to the NHS spend, it's a very small amount of money. One of the things I'm arguing at the moment with NHS England colleagues is if we were to include all the secondary prevention that's in, that we do in the system, of course that's a lot of which, as you know, gets done in, in primary care, quality and outcomes framework incentivises GPs to do a lot of that. Uh, if we included all the secondary prevention activity, then the figure would be much higher than 4%. And I guess what we're trying to argue here is that as we move towards the next spending review, what we're trying to do is influence the Treasury to make sure that if there is an amount that's going to be spent on prevention, then we've got some idea what the baseline is now. Uh, because what the, you know, for those of you who've seen the five-year forward view for the NHS, what the five-year forward view talks about is a radical upgrade, quote, radical upgrade to prevention. And if we don't have that radical upgrade, then treatment, new treatments, new drugs, new technologies will continue to crowd out what we want to do around prevention. So what we're trying to argue is that actually we need to have a higher percentage of what I've called there the protective preventive spend. And that seems to be absolutely essential if we're going to do things differently in the NHS. And those funding gaps that I've presented there are predicated on business as usual. And again, those of you who know the NHS, and you can see it in the news all the time, trust financial deficits are already much higher than they were predicted to be a year ago. And so those funding gaps could, could get worse. So, Friday night, I'll start depressing you. <laughs> but, but that is the financial picture we're in. And the reason why I portray that at the start is because it gives rise to what I've called the, the prevention challenge. And this is the stuff of my day job, I suppose. This is what I try to spend all my time internally in Public Health England persuading colleagues about uh, locally with people who help support and direct the Public Health and people in local authorities to try and make the, or increasingly it's called make the business case for investing in prevention and those three things are really important so the, the sort of the sort of E101 I suppose is all these things are different so doing the most cost effective things is really important that's different to saving the system money, but that is a big, big challenge. As I said, I think people want to try and get money out of the system now. Uh, and that is different, again, from demonstrating what I've called their return on investment. That return on investment terminology is really important because it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terminology that local government understands. People in local government make business cases all the time for investing in transport, environment, housing and so on. And what we're trying to do, I suppose, in health is to try and put that on the same sort of playing field so that we're persuading local government about what they need to do to invest in, in, in prevention and public health. So that's, that's what I've called the prevention challenge. I'll, I'll skip over, over that one. <coughs> Life does feel a bit that this isn't me, this was Harrison Ford or whoever it was in, in, in the Holy Grail. But that, that prevention challenge does feel like the Holy Grail. So if we got all of these things right, if we manage to do all the most cost-effective things, demonstrate that everything we do, do provides a return on investment and save the system money, then I, I would be a very rich person, and I'm not. So, um, the other thing I just wanted to share with you is, is some work that we're, we're doing at the moment in relation to what is increasingly called the compressed morbidity hypothesis. I'll explain it in a second, but the, the challenge, alongside the sort of financial challenge, we've got this very real challenge that, of course, you know, good news, people are living longer on the whole. Um, that can't keep going forever, but actually life expectancy on the whole is, is increasing. Um, we still have enormous variation across the country in that, uh, variation that still surprises people, you know, the, the variation in life expectancy in our uh, worst off places in the country, even, in place, even, even within cities, within Sheffield, in Bradford, the life expectancy difference is absolutely enormous. Um, healthy life expectancy, uh, so the amount of time people are spending in good quality of life, is not keeping pace with the advances in life expectancy. And we have two comp very competing hypotheses here. One, one is that one school of thought is that people are living longer with more years of ill health, so what we might call an expanded morbidity hypothesis. And of course, the more we get prevention right, the more that's likely to be the case. Uh, so we might be diagnosing people earlier, we might be 
in successful screening programs or better lifestyle advice, which means that actually people are living longer but with, with more uh, with morbidity for a longer period of time. The competing hypothesis to that is the compressed morbidity hypothesis, which is that um, people are actually, yes, still potentially living longer, but actually the compressed morbidity into a short period of time at the end of life. And you can see that for some people this is very potentially attractive when you put it in the context of saving the system money. So keeping people in good health for longer, but actually they, they then put it bluntly die quickly. And the, the sort of wider economic impact of this, I suppose, in, in context for this is around productivity, pensions, informal care. If you work on the basis that the pension age is, what, 68 now, and by the time my children are my age, it's probably going to be in the 70s, um, people are going to be working for a very long time. At the moment, I think if you look at healthy life expectancy, then by the time people are 68 now, according to current figures, very few people are living in, in, in uh, uh, morbidity-free life. So the wider economic context, of course, is to keep people in health, in good health, for as long as possible. And that raises some really important debates about end-of-life care. Uh, it raises some really important issues about extent to which we can get prevention and early intervention right in itself has to be a good thing you would argue but assessing that wider impact and the benefits at a more macroeconomic level is a real challenge um, just diagrammatically i don't don't want to go through all this diagram but the second one down is really the key one this this com compression mor morbidity hypothesis so the assumption is that we're getting increases in life expectancy increases in survival but that, that 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 quality of life has been compressed into the, the final years of life. So the, these are the sorts of things we're grappling with, I suppose, at a macro level, because it's it's incredibly important not just for the health system but for the wider economy. The national and national the national and international evidence in this territory, I'm not going to dwell on. There's some really interesting stuff from Australia that basically says the more you look at uh, preventive interventions, virtually all of the ones you look at are highly cost effective. The one that I'll, I'll just skip over to uh, the UK evidence, there was a piece that was written in 2011 by colleagues at NICE. NICE has been evaluating uh, public health interventions for about 11 years now. Um, and when the more that uh, NICE has done this, the, basically this the key result here is, is this one, which says that Roughly 85% of everything that NICE had looked at by the time that was written was deemed cost effective at the threshold that NICE uses. So again, you're probably familiar with the sort of £20,000 cost per quality, quality adjusted life year threshold that NICE uses. 85% of the interventions that were looked at then were, were deemed cost effective. Um, and a number of those, 15%, were actually deemed to be cost saving. So. The, the bottom line is that you, the more we look at public health interventions, the more they're highly cost effective, which again comes back to this conundrum we've got. Well, if it's such an obvious thing to do, why, why is it so difficult? So that, that's what I'd like to explore a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this one here. Um, John mentioned diabetes earlier, and I still still work quite actively in, in the area of diabetes. Our public health observatory, as John knows, led on a lot of the diabetes intelligence. I still very actively involved in the diabetic eye screening program uh, nationally with, with the UK National Screening Committee. I always use diabetes as a good example of us trying to get that shared case across the NHS and public health. We have got a diabetes prevention program that is shared by Public Health England and NHS England. And I don't need to tell this audience that you know, this is about getting good control in primary care. It's getting people screened and getting consistent access to screening across the country. It's about avoiding uh, hospital admissions for some of the more uh, difficult complications of, of diabetes. But at the same time as we talk about all these things being good things, we actually have a system, and apologies for the acronym, the PBR is the Payment by Result System. So that is the system by and large by which hospitals get paid. So, to put it blunt, if you were explaining this to members of the public, essentially what you'd be saying is, what we're doing is rewarding the healthcare system for dealing with all the complications of diabetes, at the same time as we're trying to get more prevention and stop people from getting uh, 
diabetes in the first place. The incentives are not right, and that's a major part of what I spend uh, my life doing, trying to work with NHS England and others to try and get the incentives in the right place. So that's, that's just one example. There could be lot, lots of examples that I could, I could use there. So that's the problem, um, and as I say, if it was that easy, then the NHS would have would have done it by now. And the bits, so it's a bit of a busy slide. I'll just pick out a couple of things from this slide. One of the problems we've got is that there's an incentive about using uh, informa economic information. So I said earlier, economics is an aid to decision making. Cost per quality adjusted life year information has been around for a long time. Um, but you know and I know that chief executives in the NHS don't sit around using cost per quality lead tables and deciding we're going to commission this and we won't commission that. Because these are essentially rationing decisions. And rationing decisions are very unpopular in the NHS. So there's a big incentive question there about actually using the economic evidence. The other one that I'd like to point to on this slide is the one about culture change and um, that taking time. So that's not just about having the information, but actually being in a position where people take calculated risks. NHS chief executives don't typically take calculated risks because the system doesn't support them to do that. And the other real challenge in all of this that I'll probably come back to later is the one around time horizons. So we still largely operate in an annual budgeting cycle. And what we really need to do is have a move towards much longer term planning horizons. So those of you who keep up with the, the latest changes in the NHS will have heard of STPs. So one or two nods. So STPs are sustainability and transformation plans. So the, the important thing about them is that, the, well, there's probably two, two things that are important about them. One is, that they're supposed to take a longer time horizon. So the three, the, the, the word in the street is a three to five year planning horizon. Um, so that should allow people to start to think a bit more about prevention and early intervention within a longer time horizon. The other thing that's important about them is that they're joint across uh, the NHS and local government. And so again, you would hope that this will allow a bit more systematic planning to do the things that we know need to be done in a joined up way between local government and, and, and the NHS. So let, let me just take an example there to, to hopefully bring that to life. So at the moment we've got money in different parts of the system to tackle obesity, which we know is a, 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 a huge problem across, across the country. We have a massive problem in obesity. Um, at the moment, if you look at the, where the budgets are spent, we've got a relatively small amount spent on weight management and other things in local government. We've got a huge amount that's spent on treating morbid obesity through gastric surgery and other things in, in, in the hospital sector. If you were to look at that in total and say you had an obesity budget or a weight management budget across the system in both health and local government, you probably wouldn't allocate that budget the way it's currently allocated. So what we really want to do, and this is what the Child uh, Obesity Plan is about, is about getting what, what people call upstream. So getting the prevention and early intervention right, so that we're avoiding all the, the, the more expensive consequences of obesity further downstream. But it has to be done in a joined up way. And traditionally we've not done that. We've not done that between health and local government. And the budgetary system is getting in the way of that. If you don't have joint budgets and joint commissioning, then it's very difficult to bring that about. But the other point about time horizons is critical. If you're an NHS chief executive traditionally, you know, and I've had these conversations with PCT chief executives over the years, how do you persuade a PCT chief executive to, to invest long term in childhood obesity when the average life expectancy in a job of a of an NHS chief executive is about two years. That's how long an NHS chief executive can expect to be in post. Well, talking about 10, 15 year time horizon just isn't going to cut it. Um, so the new STPs at least offer a hope of having a longer term time horizon, even if that's only three to five years. And I think, I think we've had quite a lot of success nationally with current sector of state in terms of persuading him that that, that longer term time horizon is absolutely critical. When we first started conversations around the childhood obesity strategy, as it was called at the time, 
People were very fixated on December 2019, 2020, and then there was the end of the electoral cycle. And there was a lot of conversation about how how we just need to take a longer term view on that. And I think we won that argument. And so even politicians are now are starting to think beyond the current electoral cycle. So in terms of the childhood obesity plan, people are already talking about a 10 year horizon, which is great. So we've had some quite significant successes there. And I think our chief executive in Public Health England is feeling that even though we've, we've certainly not got everything we want in the childhood obesity plan, but it's a really important start. Um, so a year ago, we didn't think sugar tax was going to be on the agenda, and it happened. Um, so we, we need to, at Public Health England nationally, keep pushing on some of these big issues. And alcohol, which I can't say a great deal about at the moment, but we're, we're hoping to continue the work that we've started on an alcohol evidence review, uh, which will be trying to persuade government that there are things that government needs to do in that space as well. These are really important public health successes. E-cigarettes, plain packaging, these are really important successes. But you have to have the incentives right and you have to have the longer term time horizon. So, let me just do a quick check on time. About 10 minutes, one, 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come to what I think are some of the more important issues to come in here. Um, I mentioned alcohol, and that's what I'm going to turn to now. So, Back in 2010, I think it was, NICE produced guidance on alcohol disorders uh, preventing harmful drinking. So everything I've got here uh, in the next couple of slides is from NICE, so it's all evidence-based. Um, this is a quote from The Economist in 2013, just talking about the wider economic effects and societal effects of, of alcohol misuse. Another area, like obesity, where we have got a huge problem as a country. And, and we have to tackle it, and we have to tackle it uh, in terms of... People remember Derek Wanless, uh, who, Derek the Wanless reports in the 2000s. So Derek Wanless talked about the fully engaged scenario. I've got a slide earlier that I skipped over. But Derek Wanless got it absolutely right, I think, um, in that he recognised that if we're going to tackle these really tough problems around obesity and alcohol, it needs individual responsibility, it needs community responsibility, it needs the NHS to do its bit, it needs local government to do its bit, and it needs national government to do its bit. It needs the whole system to work together. Um, and in the case of something like alcohol misuse, you can read that for yourselves, but some of the, the... We know that alcohol misuse is not just a problem for the health sector, it spills over into the criminal justice sector and so on. So what the NICE guidance talked about in 2010 was this, this issue about a combination of population and individual approaches. At the time they suggested that policy change uh, at a national level was likely to be more cost effective than actions taken by local health <coughs> professionals. We've got really good evidence uh, through brief interventions in alcohol that can be done in primary care. Really good evidence from NICE that if you do stuff at individual level and at organisational and national level, it will make a significant difference. What we have to do in PHE is keep pushing out that evidence um, and, and to begin to think about how we start to structure uh, what we want to say around um, national policies such as uh, taxation and pricing. I do want to emphasise that these are nice, this is still nice evidence we're looking at here, this is not PHE. Uh, recommendations around pricing and taxation, but we are currently actively looking at the evidence around taxation and pricing. Um, really interesting work from Australia that was done in 2014 that looked at uh, minimum, use, minimum unit pricing alongside what's called volumetric taxing, that's essentially tax according to um, volume, percentage of alcohol content. Um, and the conclusions from that study was that both minimum unit pricing and volumetric taxation have got the potential to reduce heavy consumption without, cru crucially, without adversely affecting light and moderate consumers. A lot of uh, what's often argued by the industry here is that if you, if you put in place these sort of t fiscal measures then you, you disadvantage light and moderate drinkers as well and, and that evidence is suggesting that's not the case. 
And the Australian study that I'm quoting there said that minimum unit pricing offers the potential to achieve greater reductions in, in heavy consumption. So we, we're gradually gathering international evidence uh, around what fiscal uh, policy is likely to achieve here. And, and I think our hope is that we'll be able to present that uh, evidence review uh, to ministers. Uh, I would hope later, later this year, but we don't know that. Um, Scotland obviously is, is, uh, has been leading the way in some of this. As you know, um, Scotland introduced, um, tried to introduce minimum unit pricing. That's been gone through the courts and the European Union. Um, the Scottish Whisky Association launched a, a judicial review against it. So that's working its way around the courts. But one of the things that NICE said at the time was that it's worth thinking about and revising legislation on licensing. Um, where as that first bullet point there, protection of the public health is actually one of uh, the objectives of legislation in Scotland. We don't have that in England. The more I've looked at the alcohol area, the more you realise that actually there's an awful lot that can be done locally. Local authorities have got very clear responsibilities and powers through the Licensing Act to, to do stuff locally. So if you take that alongside what the NHS can do and what nationally government can do, there's a tremendous opportunity here to, to do something really quite substantial around alcohol and we'll continue to present the evidence base around that to, to government. So summary of the alcohol stuff, alcohol, uh, sorry, action needed, alcohol needed at all levels of the system, action needed at all levels of the system, um, scope to consider national policies, local governments get some key levers, NHS interventions are cost effective. Um, so our, our role, as I say, is to both advocate and to present the tools and resources to help people make decisions locally. The bits, so it's got three more slides, uh, the bits I'd like to just finish on are some challenges and some opportunities and then some final reflections. Um, against my better judgement, I was persuaded to do a blog series, I've never done a blog series before. Uh, but there's a health economics blog series and the link to it, if you get the slides and you're interested, then have a click on the link. Uh, it says probably you know, everything that I, I would like to say around investing in prevention, some of which you'll have covered tonight, but not all of it. Um, and so the first slide is on challenges. The timescale one, I won't labour that again, it's key. The incentive issue is one ditto. One of the biggest problems we've got, and the reason why I talked about joined up commissioning and joined up budgets is that one of the biggest problems we have at the moment in both the NHS and local government is people, there is a big incentive issue. You invest in one area, but actually the benefits or savings are realised elsewhere. That's a critical incentive issue that, that can easily be resolved if we start to think about joint commissioning and joint budgets. Um, the only other point I'd bring out from this slide is the penultimate one there about system change. Um, one of the things I've been arguing with colleagues in PHE and I think we will take to the Treasury to argue is this question of if we're seriously going to change the shift the curve towards investing in prevention do we actually need an element of double running costs? The analogy I tend to use here is there's a mental health system where you know in the past we had an institutional largely institutionally based mental health system everybody agreed we had to move to a more community based uh, care system that didn't happen overnight and it didn't you have to do an element of actually double running in both systems. Now at the moment, I, I took a bit of a deep breath before I even tried to argue that with the Chief Economist in the Department of Health, but interestingly he was absolutely on board with this and I'd also actually used the mental health example. There's a risk of being ridiculed, I suppose, at the moment in that financial climate of saying actually we need double running costs, but actually uh, I think we seriously do. And the Local Government Association argued this last year they called for a transformation fund for prevention. In other words, to move, to really get the upgrade we need, we need to uh, help the system to move from one to, one to the other. The opportunity, I would say, that we've got at the moment is using all of local government resources to improve health. So that example I used earlier, about, you know, the public health budget is a very, very small part of local government budget. So, the council here, like other local authorities, has got a huge budget around housing, transport, education. So notwithstanding the cuts that people are taking, if you take all of those budgets alongside the public health budget, there's a real opportunity to think about how you use all of that in the best way to, to improve people's health. Um, 
And, and that the, the only final point I think there is about maintaining the focus on the most cost effective, what I call the upstream preventive interventions. And if we can release cash in the system, fantastic. But that, that is what I think I would call icing on the cake. So my, my last slide, and again these are personal reflections, I emphasise that. Um, I think the Treasury is hungry for examples of where we've done this. So they're looking to, you know, where in local government are the NHS of people really genuinely invested in prevention, in early intervention, and where has it worked? Can we gather case studies of where it's worked? What they're sceptical about, and those of you who worked in the NHS a long time have seen these things over the years, you know, invest to save lots of potential uh, areas of saving money that have frankly never quite delivered. So the Treasury is very sceptical of the sort of invest to save area. What we need to absolutely do is find real examples of where it's worked. Um, this point about the bar being set higher is one that I've, I've raised several times with colleagues in Public Health England and actually it's, it's pretty well recognised that is, this is the case. What I mean by it is that for prevention people are asking us to be both doing the cost effective things and demonstrating that but also saving money. And my pushback on that is that actually the NHS doesn't have to demonstrate that. The, again, you, you know in the NHS there's still lots of things the NHS does that are not cost effective, things where they're clearly not the right thing to do in cost effectiveness terms. The NHS doesn't also have to demonstrate that what it does saves money. So that's what I mean by the bar being set higher for prevention and we have to tackle, and we are tackling that issue with the Treasury. And I'll finish with that point about the, uh, the bit about keeping the eye on the long term price. So, at the moment, that sort of 4% figure of preventive, preventive spend across the economy um, is something that we absolutely want to change. So if you think about that, let's say 125 billion across the NHS and public health and social care, we want to make sure that the amount that we're devoting to prevention and early intervention is a much higher share of that cake. And that's, that's the challenge for the next four years as we move to the next uh, spending review. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. That was uh, very interesting. Um, are you open for yes, questions? Yes, yeah, yeah. questions? Cool. Yeah. Um, if you uh, were suddenly put in total charge of the NHS, oh. and you could do anything you want, yeah, great and um, you know, everyone would agree and follow you, mm. with the mess that it's in at the moment, mm. Okay, we all know, you say there's rationing, people are against rationing, why is that? What would you do? I mean, we could turn the camera off. If you were, yeah, what, what would you do? Because you two seem to know that, because yeah. it, it's, I just don't like the way it's been managed. It's been this way for a long, long time, really. ever since they brought in the market system, yeah. the false market system. It's just been awful. So, so there are two magic wands I could wave. What, one would be around the incentive system, so I'd come back to that one, because I say, it is perverse, this situation we've got at the moment, where we, we are rewarding the stuff that just is not the stuff that we want to see done. So if we really want to get prevention and early intervention, so I, I would label that point, so I've, I've, I've covered that one. The, the other one that I would come back come to is information systems, which sounds very mundane, but actually is a major block to a lot of the things we want to do. So I remember going to meetings in the Department of Health 25 years ago where people talked about electronic patient records. Mm -hmm. Have we got them? Well, well, when I was working in the NHS before we had electronic patient records, life was much better. And when we wanted information, we got it. Now we can't get it. It's just got worse. And it's, but it's hugely, I mean, you were lucky probably if you worked on it, but it's, it's so variable. Yeah. So I, I've, I've often made this point in colleagues with the information centre where so if people actually knew that in some parts of the country you could walk into the hospital and they'd have all your primary care records electronically and you just pull it all out. But in another part of the country, 100 miles away, you couldn't do that. We wouldn't tolerate that in banks, would we? We wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't go on holiday to Torquay and find out the HSBC you can access your account. Yeah, it'd be a nonsense, wouldn't it? But in the NHS we've got that problem. And it's, although it sounds a mundane thing, it's a big barrier. 
because everybody talks about, and including me, about care pathways. You know, when John worked with us on the diabetes health intelligence stuff, we'd, we, we, we looked at it in that pathway model, didn't we? And we got really good information on prevalence, the prevalence model, right through to what's happening in terms of complications and hospital admissions for diabetes and so on. We, we looked right across the pathway. But the number of people, and I, I sat this afternoon in the, the National Cardiovascular Intelligence Network Partnership Board where national clinical directors were banging on about this, researchers were still banging on about it. We need record linkage of data across the system to allow us to do some of the things we want to do. So if I could wave a magic wand, I'd get the incentives right, which I've got some influence on, who knows whether we'll be successful, but the information systems in getting electronic patient records right is a massive challenge. So there are a couple. There was a question here, I think. Yeah, thanks very much. Very interesting. Uh, two, two points. One's, I guess, a comment and the other's a question. Um, my background is in obstetrics and, and I have experience of talking to brick walls um, in, in, in the, uh, the places in London about the idea that the huge expenditure on obstetric litigation when things go wrong could be reduced by putting some money into training uh, the staff to make sure that things don't go wrong and at present the, the uh, training is the first thing that goes when pressures yeah. are, are, are high and everyone nods and nothing uh, has happened it, 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 it's, it's just extremely frustrating it seems a very you know parochial example but the idea that prevention can prevent uh, a huge expenditure of money um, simply there isn't any mechanism for, for people um, recognizing that. So that's my, that's my comment. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is, I was interested in the, uh, the, the, the fact that people look, are looking for success stories to say, how can you uh, uh, expand that? I just wonder what lessons there are economically from the reduction in smoking that has occurred over the last, what, what, I don't know how many years, but you, it, it, there's a clear fact that, that the public smoking has become less acceptable but going to into the centre of York and getting pissed and calling yeah. it a river is yeah. still acceptable yeah. and yeah. walking around looking like you know a grotesque yeah. obese uh, yeah. example is still acceptable is yeah. there any uh, way of you know relating those yeah i think there is it's a it's a really interesting question i mean there's a number of things i suppose i mean one is is that thing the thing you put your finger on is a bit about public acceptability um, and as you say you know it's i mean i remember what, what was the the bar in micklegate the not what's called now, but it was the first smoke free pub in york it was the brigand yeah you know it, it, it was it, that 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 was the start of that in york and and now we, people are hugely intolerant of smoking uh, in public places and so what, what we need to do is, is, I think as you're saying, is actually get the same sort of public debate around them. I mean, I, I, I actually think we should have a public debate on stuff like this, because I think the public understand this much more than we give them credit for. But the, I mean, the politicians, I think, are actually quite, I think, quite frightened of the public debate here. And, and I think we need to persuade them, and probably our thing, I think, has got a role to, to up the ante on that public debate. So. For example, um, around alcohol, as you say, you know, we have this very, at one level, this very libertarian view of alcohol. If, well, everybody can, you know, it's, we're a free society, we can do what we like. Well, and I've had this debate with people in you know, the Institute of Economic Affairs and other places, which are very right wing sort of think tanks, where you sort of want to say, to them, well, actually, it's not just about that, because there are what economists would call externalities here, which, in other words, the, ex the side effects of alcohol misuse which as you say you know ask any police constable you know about a, a, a city centre throughout the country on a Friday night ask any person who works in A&E who gets threatened on a Friday night um, ask women or, or partners who get beaten up at home through domestic violence as a result of alcohol binge drinking drink driving all these things you know is that really do we really think it's just okay to let people do what they want and ditto obesity. Um, there, there is a huge individual responsibility alongside all the other things that we can do nationally. But I 
think it needs a public debate on what you know that example I gave on a bit if you had an obesity budget, you know, if we were on the charge of that obesity budget locally, how would we spend it? Well I think most people if you ask them would rather that it wasn't spent on treating the morbidly obese, but that actually it was been spent on making sure that our kids didn't get to that stage in twenty years' time. Um, but against that argument, of course, is the people who say, well, I paid my taxes and, and all the rest of it. The other point, just very quickly on, on your first one, I, mean, I know it's a comment rather than a question, but it's an interesting observation. And w when the sort of training point is just thinking, think, taking through the logic of my example of if we got the incentives right in diabetes, we would have people spending a lot less time you know, cutting off lower limbs and hopefully people not going blind and so on. And I suppose there's this part of people might think, well, what, what would all these people do then? But the, the fact is we've got a shortage of people. We've got a shortage of trained doctors. We've got a shortage. You know, they, would, they would perhaps have to retrain to do other things, but there's still lots of things they could do. There's a figure banded around which says that between a third and a half of everything that's spent on us in our lifetime in the NHS is spent in the last six months before we mm -hmm. die. Yeah. Is that something that economists recognise? I mean, is it actually mm. more or less true? Yeah. Um, yeah. And if so, is there any discussion about how sensible that is? Because yeah, you wouldn't do it with a car, would you? That's a really interesting question. The, I know I skipped over it very quickly and it could probably be a whole lecture in itself, but that compressed morbidity discussion is exactly where, where you're heading with that. So the, the short answer is it is true. I can't, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but when you look at the, the cost curve across an individual's lifetime in terms of healthcare costs, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a very big spike in costs at the end of life. And this is why the sort of compressed morbidity idea is, is gathering a bit of traction because it's, as I said, very attractive at one level that you know, if you can keep people as healthy as long as possible and then you know, they, so they not quite drop dead in the last six months, you know what I mean, it, it, it potentially saves costs in that last period of, period of, of life. Um, so there is a lot of debate around that but I, um, the reason why I touched on it a little bit is because what my understanding of it is that it's, it really just isn't that simple. So I had, I had a really good conversation with a, um, I don't often Skype with Harvard professors, but I did have a Skype conversation with a Harvard professor called David Bloom recently to ask him about this stuff. And he's done research in this territory for a long time. And there is a really quite big literature on this. And his overall take was, you know, I, I portrayed the expanded morbidity hypothesis and the compressed morbidity. So, it, the evidence is really ambiguous on it. Um, so, I, so I'm actually literally in the process of compiling a briefing paper on this within PHE, but then to try and get some data to to look at what you're saying. So not to look at the cost data, but also to look at what's actually happening when we look at the life expectancy and health, healthy life expectancy data across the, the country. Um, but what you describe is a really, really important issue. Um, because what people are looking for is solutions to, they're usually coming at it from the, save, the cost saving perspective, that if we could get this right, then we save money to the system, but also it's about these wider economic effects. You can imagine, you know, a government that can keep, you know, a country can keep people working as long as possible, healthy, healthy, you know, morbidity free, is, is an attractive thing for the economy. Until they live longer and are healthy in the end. The, the really difficult bit in all of this, and this is the bit where we turn the cameras off, but people often say to me, quite right, we've all got to die of something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a bit of a heretical thing for a public health person to say, but um, we are a bit obsessed as a nation with life expectancy. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my wife works in the, the cancer field and has done for many years and, and the only time we argue at home is about stuff like this. Um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, and I've had these arguments myself with oncologists and where, and, and of course it's their, it's their job to find new drugs and, you know, and they get excited when they find a new drug that's going to give an extra three months survival, but when you want to pick it and you think, what are the quality of life? What are the side effects in that three months? Mm -hmm. Of course, people are going to get upset because they're trying to do their best, but actually, is it the best thing for the patient? So I, 
I think you know when I talk to people, what people are really ang what, what people are really anxious about is is things like things like cancer, things like dementia. People are as frightened about dementia as they are about cancer. Yeah. And if you if you offer people the choice of actually living, I think to, you know, seventy five in a really healthy life versus living to eighty five with you know, with really really deteriorating dementia. Mm -hmm. I think I know what most, most people would say. Alan Williams, who invented the quality, I don't know if anybody knew Alan, he was in York for many years, he died a few years ago. Alan got himself into big trouble by describing what's called the fair innings approach. Mm -hmm. But he could do it because he was that sort of age, I think he was 72 when he died. But he argued actually, you know, it's just people like me used to say, you know, 70, I've had a, I've had a fair innings, I've had a good quality of life, give the money to younger people, mm -hmm. put the money into investing in, in, in early years and all of that. Um, but of course, you know, other, other people get very upset about stuff like that. But it is about quality of life. And a lot of the research that the university here, the Centre for Health Economics here has done, has shown that the biggest driver of system healthcare costs at the moment is actually not so much age in itself, but comorbidity. Mm -hmm. So that people, because they're living longer, of course, as you know, are living with more and more comorbidity. And that's a massive driver of cost and probably not very good for people's quality of life. So it's, it's <laughs> complex territory, isn't it? <coughs> it is, it is. I think it, one of the things I've, I've observed, obviously, in Scotland, they've changed the level of alcohol for drink driving. Yeah, they have. Mm -hmm. And that has had a massive yeah. uh, change in behaviour. Yeah. Obviously for a cohort of people for who are worried about that. I mean obviously yeah. there's a cohort of people who will not be yeah. care what it is. No, that's but right. it's actually made a huge difference to uh, a lot of my friends who live up there and what they're prepared to do because um, it, it has. And, and your, your question earlier touched on that, but the, so the smoking ban, one of the first places it got evaluated was Scotland. And some of the early evidence that's coming out of Scotland on, on that, what you're describing, is exactly what you're saying, that actually because the limit is so low now, the, 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 the thing that's been reported in some of the research studies is that people are just not drinking. Mm -hmm. So it's, if, they, if they know they're going to be driving. Right. So it's not like here, you know, where we're probably going, oh, I can have a pint or a pint yeah. and a half or a glass yeah. of wine. People, people are actually saying, I just, I just, it's too risky, I just not drink at all. I was talking to a friend uh, on the golf course 10 days ago, on a week last, yesterday, who says now in Scotland there's these entrepreneurs who will arrive on their um, uh, fold-up motorbikes. They're fully insured. They come and pick you up when you've actually decided you're going to have a drink. Put their motorbike in your car and drive you home in your car. <laughs> <laughs> Economics. Yeah. 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 The next billionaire. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the next one is Zuckerberg. I mean, I think the other sad thing that I heard recently, in one of the most, you, and you did touch on it briefly mm. about immunisations, mm. and they're saying that our childhood immunisation rates are falling again. Mm. And you just think, what a sad society, mm. something as effective as that. We have to keep our eye on the ball and all these yeah. things. And I'm a massive part of PHE, um, Public Health England, which I'm not involved in. But uh, those of you who know that system know that one of the biggest parts of Public Health England is the Health Protection Agency, that whole went into PHE. So about, probably about three quarters of our staff work in health protection. Um, and they, you know, they are the people that, you know, Duncan Selby, our chief exec, said that. That's what keeps the country safe, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. it's it's at one end it's the bioterrorism, it's yeah. the hive, it's that stuff, but at the other end it's the immunisation, yeah. it's screening, it's TB, you know, TB rates yeah. in some parts of the country are yeah. going like that, mm -hmm. and and you know we, we can't take our eye off the ball yeah. on that, and and that you know is aside from all the international yeah. stuff we know around Ebola and Zika and goodness knows what. I mean, only this week I had a child, a sixteen-year-old, with whooping cough. Yeah. Yeah. Positive, yeah, positive blood test for yeah. the yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. Yeah, they're still they're still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, it's a sort of observation in a way that there is this sort of um, lag of um, benefits, isn't there? Yes. I mean, one example I think of the seatbelt law came yeah. in. That was an abrupt change yeah. with a pretty rapid demonstrable effect yeah. on yeah. mortality, morbidity, and, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, and the morbidity from road traffic accidents yeah. is, is sometimes very prolonged. You're talking about a young person yeah. with a lifetime yeah. of morbidity. Yeah. Um, 
the alcohol effect in, in Scotland, some of that will be quite quick, mm -hmm. the, the, the issues you've talked about. Mm -hmm. The issue of smoking is, is probably rather more prolonged. Mm -hmm. It takes much longer to have a demonstrable effect on the incidence of lung cancer, lung cancer. all yeah. the other things yeah, that yeah. are called. Yeah. Yeah. And these are much more difficult yeah. for governments yeah. to accept and, yeah. and build policy on, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely. I mean, maybe fixed-term parliaments are better in that sense that you know they, you've got at least five years yeah. to work with, rather than maybe expecting a, yeah. Um, yeah. an election yeah. in possibly yeah. eighteen months' yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a couple of things. I mean, one. I mean, really glad you used this seatbelt example because in my blog, if you do want to look at it, it's got that example of seatbelts and the, the 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 context in which I raise it there is actually around the nature of evidence. Again, I. In the interest of time, I, I skipped over some of the uh, the nature of evidence issues around public health, but it's some of the things you've raised there. So, for example, you, again, people are probably familiar with the sort of hierarchy of evidence that the NHS uses because of meta-analyses of clinical trials, randomised clinical trials, through to you know, before and after studies or whatever. And so you've got that hierarchy of evidence. In public health, it, it's not as simple as that. And... The example I use is seatbelts. I mean, we didn't do a randomised control of seatbelts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the, the best one I heard was from the medical director at British Heart Foundation. He said, we never did a randomised control of whether parachutes worked. It's <laughs> 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 a nice thought. Um, but, you know, the, the, we, and, and the reason why that's really important is, I mean, one of the most controversial things that PHE does is health check. You know, that's a programme of work that the local government gets funded for, it's played out in primary care. But you'll, for every director of public health who thinks health check's a good thing, you'll find somebody who thinks there's, a really, you know, there's no evidence for it. My sort of, I mean, my, I have to be corporate about it, but I do actually believe it. I, I, on balance, I think it is the right thing to do. Um, it makes sense. But is there a randomised control out there, that, the control trial out there? That's, no, there isn't. Um, but your point about time lags is really critical, and, and the one I suppose I've tried to get across today, that um, th this is where it becomes really difficult to persuade your sort of hard-bitten NHS chief execs that it's the right thing to do. Um, and it's why in public health, and you know, people like Jenny have spent a career in public health and advocacy and other roles, you know, that, yeah, so somebody who was a director of public health the other week said to me, my role is a professional nag, is what she said. <laughs> and I thought, in some way, she was right, she said, that sort of drip, drip effect is, is so important in public health. You have to spend all your career reminding people, just reminding people. And, and you know, the CMO, Sir Liam Donson, when he, was, when he was CMO, he got through the smoking ban, and he did it by continually... Finding the moment to nag, but but continually reminding people actually that smoking is still one of the, you know, despite as you say the prevalence rates coming down. You know, in West Yorkshire, a place like Wakefield, smoking prevalence is still over twenty percent. You know, the parts of the country where it's still really high. Uh, and but you find some people who think we've done smoking. You know, we can move on now. Well, we've not. For all the reasons you've given, and it's not just about lung cancer, but all the other diseases. But that time lag issue is so critical. And it's why we have to keep persuading people that even though the benefits are further off, we have to keep our attention on it. And if we don't keep our attention on obesity and alcohol, we are stoking up any number of problems for the future in health and economic terms. You, you talked about sort of dealing with, with government, government ministers. Um, you mentioned Liam Donaldson there. I mean, again... He okay, was CMO. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think uh, I'm right in saying that he had to threaten to resign um, before John Reid um, was willing to push through the smoking public places um, bill. Does it make you cross that our very top medical leaders don't jump up and down and bang the desk when they see things like the obesity, childhood obesity plans being watered down? So spectacular. It's a really tricky one. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, this is really fresh in my mind because it was the Public Health England conference last week, um, and Duncan Selby spoke at that. And you can you can probably Google that and have a look at his talk if you want to hear what he said directly. But his sort of response to that is, 
is very much the drip drip response. His line, his official line is, we we've got some progress. That's that's all we've got. We've got some progress. It's not the end of the story. It's the start. It's, it's like cliche, but it's the start of the journey. So as I say, sugar tax. A year ago, we would not have expected to see that come to fruition. Um, we're currently working actively with Department of Health and others around reformulation. Now, I think the, the, the specific plan is something to take something like to uh, take sugar out of 20% of, of all that. I don't quote it on the figures, but, but, but to, to, to achieve that kind of reduction in the amount of sugar in our food chain is absolutely enormous, and we're, we're now on with that. We're working with industry now on that. That's a massive bit of progress. Have we got everything we wanted in the childhood abuse plan? No, nowhere near. But I think Duncan's view, rightly, I think, is that you, you just have to take what you can get and work with that. So his response will be, thank you very much, we've got that, we've banked that, now what we'd like is X, Y and Z. And timing is everything. You, you mentioned Liam's, but timing was absolutely everything on that. And I remember, I remember at the time, I, remember, I still can picture the Health Service Journal article where, you, where I remember reading it and thinking, Liam's putting his career on the line for this now. He must be confident. And Liam was the arch politician, wasn't he? He was a brilliant CMO who judged it perfectly and we got it. And timing is everything. Um, so I, I may just be a hopeless optimist, but I, I genuinely believe, and I think our Chief Exec genuinely believes, that we will get there on some of the alcohol-related policies. It may take quite a lot of time, but we will get there. And, and polit politics can surprise you. Um, I'm not, I think, talking out of turn in, because I think it was politic. I think it was in the papers and in the media that the, sh the sugar tax um, decision actually took the Department of Health and Secretary of State for Health by surprise, because it came straight from Downing Street. So some of these things suddenly happen that you know you really do come appear to come from left field, but. It's that constant lobbying that's, that's critical, and who knows who's going to have the final say. If there was one person that probably <coughs> more influence in that decision, it was Jamie Oliver. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's from a public health professional's point of view, it's usually frustrating because, I mean, I've been to health select committees, um, and you know, you get taken note of maybe <laughs> that tiny little bit, and then there's other people get taken note of that. Jamie Oliver, <laughs> all he did was take a load of sparkling juice and put a bottle around in every pot and they all went, look at the amount of sugar in this, this is unbelievable, <laughs> because we've been saying that for years. Um, but if the right person says it at the right time, it can happen like that. And it took Jamie Oliver by surprise. Was it Sam Camp? <laughs> Sorry, was it Sam, Samantha Cameron who got it through? <laughs> <laughs> Brian. I think um, you probably have enough questions now. Okay. Um, one of my rules is actually I should ask a member to actually say thank you, but I forgot to do that. So I <laughs> to, uh, thank you, really, very uh, fascinating, really interesting talk. I thought it uh, was uh, very thought provoking. I think that uh, uh, you uh, obviously remain very optimistic. Yes. I hope that we can actually um, uh, get some further change. And I think it's a very brave man who's coming to an audience of doctors and complimented Jeremy Hunt. Turn the cameras off. Thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome.